chapter number 11. As you take your copy of God's Word, journey will be to Romans chapter number 11. Look at the briefly in verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. saves us. Romans chapters 12 through 16 speak to us primarily about what we should do now that we know why we are saved, how we are saved, and who saved us. So if you've been sleeping through Romans chapters 1 through 11, I don't know what you're going to do when we get to Romans chapter 12 through 16. <laughs> Romans chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. What about going to read it's like this? chosen obtained and the rest were hard and just as it is written God gave them a spirit of stupor eyes to see not and ears to hear not down to this day David says let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them that their eyes be darkened to see not that their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever I'm going to read one more time just because I like reading my mind what then what Israel is seeking, it has not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just that it, as it is written, God gave them, particularly Israel, a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, ears to hear not, down to this day. David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. If I can hold your attention for just a moment, I'd like to preach from the subject, the only God who saves. All right. You may have your seats. Thank you very much, ushers. You're too kind. The only God who saves. You can serve whatever God you want to. You can serve your car. You can serve your husband. You can serve your wife. You can serve your money. You can serve whatever God you want to serve. But I stood up this morning to tell you that there's only one God. invited me to attend his church service on a side of town that I was unfamiliar with. Therefore, 
after receiving this invitation to attend his service on the side of town that I was unfamiliar with, I did what any person seeking directions would do. I filed me a computer, signed into MapQuest, typed in my desired destination, identified where I was, clicked the search button to find different routes that would take me to where I wanted to go. After looking at the different routes that MapQuest provided, I finally stumbled across a set of directions that I believe was simple enough for me to follow to get me to where I desired to go. I clicked the print button, printed out my directions, proceeded to go into the living room where my grandparents were sitting to inform them that I would not be accompanying them to church the following Sunday because of the invitation I had received. To make sure that I knew where I was going, my grandfather, who knows how to get everywhere, said, which way are you going to take in order to get where you are going? When he asked me that question, I pulled my MapQuest directions and, and simply recited to him what I had printed off of the internet to which my grandfather offered me an alternative route. And by all admissions, I must admit, the route that he offered me was a lot simpler than the route I had in my hand. But because I was determined to go my own way, me, I disregarded everything he said. And you know what my way got me? to obtain salvation, but they desire to obtain it going their own way. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, there are many people who desire to be made right with God, but they want to be made right with God on their terms, when they want to do it, where they want to do it, and how they want to do it. But I stood up this morning to let somebody somewhere know that if you are going to obtain Salvation, it will not happen on your terms, but it will happen on God's terms. Translation, only one God can say. I hear what you're saying. I hear your brother, Pastor, Preacher, Reverend. That only one God can save. But why should I depend on God for salvation? I'm glad you're asking all the right questions this morning. Because here in our selected text, the Holy Spirit makes known to us why it is both you and I should depend on God for salvation. First, you should depend on God for salvation because only God can provide salvation. I thought I'd have a witness there. I thought I came to church this morning. You should depend on God for salvation because only God can provide salvation. If you graced us with your presence on last week, then you would have heard me preach a sermon I entitled Unmerited Favor. It was inside that little sermon that the question was raised, who can receive the salvation God has provided? And if you took good notes, then you would have learned that those whom God preserves can receive the salvation God provides. But not only those whom God preserves can receive the salvation God provides, but those whom God picks can receive the salvation God provides. And it was based on that argument that Paul eases his way into Romans chapter 11, particularly verses 7 and 8 by explaining 
anything who is ultimately responsible for a person's spiritual awareness. Verse number seven, Paul says, what did? <laughs> what Israel is seeking? They have not obtained it. <laughs> what Israel is seeking? Word seeking here comes from the Greek word epizeteo. Uh -huh. It literally means to try to obtain. It means to try hard to obtain. It means to wear yourself out trying to get something.
talent in the way I live for him. God chooses who receives salvation. You can't try to obtain it on your own. It comes directly from God. To prove his point, Paul borrows a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 29, particularly verse number 4. For those who try to ignore the salvation God has provided, Paul says God has hardened their hearts. He explains what he means by God has hardened their hearts by his quotation of Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse number 4. There, Paul says, God gave them a spirit of stupor. He generally explains what he means by spirit of stupor. That is, eyes to hear, eyes to see not, ears to hear not. Down even until this very day. Spirit of stupid is simply an influence that numbs your spiritual awareness. Hear me. It's a spiritual anesthetic. You come to church, but you don't feel nothing. Somebody 
somebody in life, or this religion needs somebody in life, you try to find your own righteousness. But if you accept God's righteousness, it don't matter what's going on. Hey. You, you try to find what suits you. But can I just be real with you one time? Everything in your Bible doesn't agree with your life.
prove his point that false religion cannot provide real salvation. Paul quotes Psalm 69, particularly verses 22 and 23. In Psalm 69, verses 22 and 23, David is the summons there. And David is praying to God. But do you know what David is praying? David is praying that God would intentionally hide himself from those people who participate in false religion. Psalm 69 verses 22 and 23 is the result of what takes place in 2 Samuel chapter 16. Is that Bible reading here? 2 Samuel chapter 16, there's a man by the name of Simei. Simei is a Benjamite. David is the king. But Simei is throwing rocks at the king. He's throwing rocks at the king and he's saying, you got blood on your hands. And because you got blood on your hands, God has moved you from being the king and he has given your throne to your son, Absalom. And Absalom, the Bible informs us, was a fine brother. He was, for well, lack of a better way to say it, tall, dark, all right, all right, and, and handsome. But David was just a little shepherd boy, skinny, smelling like sheep. Absalom had the jerry curl. I hit my over 40 crowd. Let me go to the under 20. He, he had the <laughs> fresh hair cut, digging in the scene with his gangster. He had it going, Absalom had it going on, and because he had it going on, people naturally followed Absalom. Say that if God hides himself from you, you 
table become a snare. Let their table become a trap. Let their table become a stumbling block. Essentially, a snare, a trap, and a stumbling block are all the same thing. David says, let their table. Scripture, many writers use the word table. Table can refer to many things. It can refer to a place where you write. It can refer to a place where you eat. It can refer to a place where you do business. Or it can refer to a place where you practice religious rituals. Here, the context of the scripture seems to support the latter. That a table is where religious rituals will take place. For instance, in a few moments, we will be observing the Lord's table. It's a religious ritual that Jesus commanded the church to do. David says, when they sit around the table to indulge in their religious rituals, my prayer is that they would stumble over their rituals. Feel the tension of the text. David's prayer is simply that they will indulge in it, but that they will not get what they indulge in it. <laughs> They'll eat that little cracker, but they don't know that it represents the body of Christ. They'll drink that little cup of juice, but they don't know that that's the blood that is five sins. They'll engage in religion, but they won't know. Their religion, David says, is not God-centered. You know what false religion is? False religion is not whether you are a Baptist or Methodist. False religion is not whether you are Pentecostal or Catholic. False religion is not none of your denominational preferences. False religion is just what David says in the text. And that is, if God is not the center of your religion. I don't care if you Methodist or Baptist. I don't care if you Pentecostal or Catholic. Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? And all is God the center of your worship. If God is not the center of your worship, you have false religion. David says, let the tables be a stumbling. Let them indulge in their religious rituals. This is what will cause people who are self-righteous to stand before God and say, God, I did what you told me to do. I partook in the Lord's Supper. Lord, I did what you told me to do. You told me to go to church. I went to church. I went to Bible study. I taught Sunday school. And God said, yeah, you did all of that. But you did that so that May could clap for you. It may clap for you. That tell May to give you a heaven to put you in. But, but God, I preach your word. Yeah, yeah, you preached it, didn't you? But, but you preached it just so Papa could tell you you did a good job. So now tell Papa to get you a paradise to dwell in. He says you got power's religion. But true religion is when I stand up and do what God has instructed to do. And if you don't say a word, I'll walk on in your house. 
false religion. Let them trip over just because they just got a bunch of members and they think they all right with God. Let them trip over that false religion. Just because they got a lot of money in the bank that they think they type with God, let them trip over that false religion. Just because people clap when they speak, let them trip over that false religion. And here's my favorite part of the text. I love it. And let their false religion be a retribution to them. <laughs> you know what a retribution is, don't you? A retribution is repayment.
I just can't make it by myself. It's a gospel song that's written by Clara Ward. Everybody knows Clara Ward for her beautiful singing voice. But nobody really knows what motivated Clara Ward to promote such good music. Clara Ward had a troublesome childhood. She was sexually abused by a cousin at a young age. She was forced by her mother to go on tour so that she could make money for the family. Needless to say, Clara Ward never had much of a childhood. So when she got older, she was trying to find deliverance from everything that she had been through. So she messed around with lesbianism. And then she messed around with various gentlemen trying to find something to fill the void. But then she went to some church and heard about a man named Jesus. And when she heard about Jesus, it was that experience that motivated her to sing the song, I got to have Jesus because I just can't make it by myself. In a real sense, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I've been trying to tell you this morning. I've been trying to tell you the words of Clara Wall. If you want salvation, you have to have Jesus because you just cannot make it by yourself. May God bless you. May God keep you.